Hello and welcome to Show Studio. I'm Stavros and we're here to talk about one of the most anticipated shows of the season, Ralph Simmons and his Autumn with 18 collection that he just showcased in New York called Youth in Motion. Um, before we start talking about the phenomenon, the Belgian prodigy, the long-lasting career, and of course, an Automedia 18 collection that featured the book by Kuki Müller and Glenn O'Brien called Drugs, as well as Christiane F. Um, I would like to introduce the amazing set of panelists that they're here with me today, starting with you, Mandy. Hi, um, I'm Mandy Leonard, and I run a fashion consultancy called Mandy's Basement. I'm Karen Binns, I'm a stylist and creative director. I'm Steve Sautra, and I'm Fashion Features Editor at ID Magazine. I'm Andrew Davis, and I'm a stylist. So, guys, thank you very, very much for being here today. Um, and while I was coming here, I was start thinking about where we, where we should start with talking about Ralph Simmons. And because, obviously, you know, the beginning, everyone pretty much knows it. You know, he was born in Belgium. Um, he didn't study fashion menswear design. He actually studied furniture industrial design in Ghent. Uh, he went and he did an internship with Walden Robert between 1991 and 1993. He saw a show, uh, the Magella All White Show in 1991, and uh, after Linda Lopa um, encouraged him to create his own brand, he started his own brand in 1995. Since then, he has, he has remained independent. He's one of the very, very few designers that has remained independent until today. And I would like to ask your views on it, how important it is for a designer to be independent. And also, I would like to throw four key words in the table, because you're four amazing panelists. And each one of you want to pick up one word and basically discuss the concept of independent with, together with that word. The four key words is isolation, creative freedom, time, and um, challenge, order. So, who would like to go first? Mandy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, as you know, I, I, isolation is my favorite word. I love the word isolation, <laughs> and Ralph also loves the word isolation. Um, and, and I think, you know, even at this stage of his career where he's doing these incredible things, he's work, you know, doing Calvin Klein, mm -hmm. Um, and, and everyone's anticipating his every move. Um, he's still very much um, isolated. Mm -hmm. So he has his own independent brand, which, which I think he thrives on. And actually that is, that is so important to him. Mm -hmm. So having his own independence creatively, juxtap juxtaposed with having um, the creative um, responsibility for Calvin Klein. Mm -hmm. um, he wouldn't be able to do Calvin Klein if he didn't do his own independent label. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I find it amazing that you know all the hype beasts and everybody is so obsessed by Raph now. <laughs> and and you know the way that they behave, it's almost like there's this new kid on the block. Yes. Whereas you know he's just been so enduring. Mm -hmm. And um, when he grew up, um, he was incredibly isolated. Mm -hmm. But that actually. Um, when he saw glimmers and chinks um, in fashion's armour of things that excited him, not just fashion, but culturally. Um, Peter Saville, um, all that kind of Hacienda era, um, punk. Um, these are the things that really motivated him to kind of um, look, that, that, that kind of were signals to him that there was something out there that he could relate to and he could build on. Do you think that I mean, uh, I completely agree with what he said, and lots of times I think about because Ralph Simmons, obviously, um, he talks so much about youth culture and about youth overall. He's been super connected with young people all these years. Do you think the concept of isolation applies to young people today or to young people overall? I think it does. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, every, with men, everyone talking about mental health, mm -hmm. um, one of the th biggest things that's come out of all that mm -hmm. Um, is this idea of young men mm -hmm. um, having depression and, and feeling, you know, th those are all the symptoms of that. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, 
I, I can't remember the question. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's, it's part, it's part of that. No, 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 I was thinking about, like, you're absolutely right, because we're talking about, like, young people as well and youth culture and, you know, how the concept of isolation applies to that. I mean, for lots of times, oh, yeah. I think about, you know, young people, and we all do it, actually, you know, that we, in the morning, we're going to put, like, our headphones and, you know, we won't like to stay in our own minds. But lots of times, I think isolation is, um, it's kind of reflected as, as something only negative, which I think there is a positive side oh, yeah. to it, of course, right? I think, I think it's like of today, you know, we're kind of, we were talking before about how we're kind of like the groupies. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and I think that, you know, you know that, that kind of excitement when you first go to a, a gig or a music <laughs> concert and there's like merch, and yes. you, buy, you went, you had this incredible dis yeah. experience. When you got home, you've got the t-shirt that you bought there. And yeah. I think, you know, he's no different. He's still that person, yeah. for yeah. sure. It's that sense of belonging, I think. Throughout your adolescence, you're, you're, that's what you're yes. striving for. You're striving to find your, you know, your peers or, yeah. or a group that you can really kind of yeah, you really belong to. That's what Raph did when, yeah. when he launched his label. Mm -hmm. I mean, he looked around the sort of the hyper sort of sexuality, sexed up ma man, like some mm. buff, buff guy in fashion as, as, a, as a hegemonic kind of yeah. ideal, and that wasn't what he related to. Yeah. You know, he was a he was a he was a kind of a skinny kid in mm. in Antwerp, and he was into punk. Yeah. They were kind of outsiders in themselves, and but they created something that you know that we're seeing echo throughout. Right, from the 80s right through to, right through to now. I, don't know, I think sometimes it's important to know that, okay, you, you said uh, isolation comes off negative. It's extremely positive. I know. Because it, it allows you to come up with an authentic idea. Correct. You yeah. don't always have to have a crew to, to, to come up with something that's valid mm -hmm. or something that can change the way people think. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes isolation is so important. Mm. Especially from a creative and artistic point of view as well, because most of... I mean, obviously, he, he has done a book that's called Isolated Heroes with David Sims, but at the same time, I think um, that the concept of isolation and sometimes isolated minds are strong minds. You know, they, they can yeah. deal with a lot of things. Karen, what's the word that you're going to pick? Time. Time. Talk to uh, me about time. Uh, time is so underrated <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean I think he has a lot of respect for time mm -hmm. the reason why I say that looks like he takes his time mm -hmm. he doesn't put everything and the kitchen sink into one thing it looks like he understands okay I'm on the journey number one number two I'm raft number five I'm raft number seven I'm raft number eight uh, a lot of people make mistakes when they're trying to say okay I'm trying to make a statement as a creator a creator must understand that there's so many levels of their creativity mm -hmm. that all needs time. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think he's so brilliant because every time I see something that he's done or any collection that he's worked on, it looks like he's taking bits and pieces and there's enough mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. that he has on this earth mm -hmm. to be able to deliver mm -hmm. all these different layers. and. Um, People underestimate that time is so important. You're yeah. absolutely right because um, in one of his interviews that he given in, at Sister Magazine, right after he left Dior, he talked a lot about the concept of time. He said that actually I didn't have enough time, you know, to to do the things the way that I want. And it wasn't about the ideas. He said that. I have ideas, I know what I want to do, I know probably he knows what he wants to do for the next 10 years, but um, he wants to build the concept correctly. And I think the pressure of these big powerhouses sometimes is about time and it's about how you um, allow people to do the right thing in the right space as well. I, I think the powerhouses have a, the word fear in the back of their head. Mm -hmm. They're so afraid someone's going to do it first. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to do that more. The fear has got to be knocked out. Yeah. Because now we are totally burnt out mm -hmm. on having to get something done and everything done at one time. That there's, there's enough room for everybody. Yeah, for sure. Not, not just done as well. It's just kind of like this relentless appetite for newness as well. Mm -hmm. uh, people put themselves under tremendous pressure to, to kind of throw away what happened before mm -hmm. and, and really kind of because they want to be talked about, they want to create content for us to all consume and talk about, but it doesn't have to be, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time, and I think that's what Raph kind of proves like consistently throughout his, throughout his career. And what is new? Exactly. And what is old? Exactly. It's irrelevant. Yeah. It's what's good. Yeah. yeah, what's good. And he delivers what's mm. good. Mm -hmm. And you know, you might even see something here that he's done four years ago, five years ago. You don't care because yeah. it's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
It's not exactly so the same. It's you know, it's, it's so, he's never. So, so Ted he's becomes never... like a bit like relevant at this stage, right? With with Ruff because he can revisit ideas, but also when you see some of the collections that he has done back, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, they're still so relevant. Oh, and so fresh. strong, so right? strong. And fresh, you know, mm -hmm. so time is irrelevant. What about you, Steve? As Steve sorry. is modelling today. Yes, as Steve is modelling. So yeah, I've got, I'm, I'm modelling. So I'm jealous. Again, I'm jealous. I'm jealous. New, new rap. <laughs> So this is this is spring summer 18, which also references sort of 2003 collection, yes. um, the Peter, the Peter Savile collaboration. Um, so it's got the new power and lies corruption. You both have motif on the back. We both, Super and I'm jealous. teaming it up with. You should show the people at home. Sorry, yeah. Your yeah. Oh, <laughs> I think you both. It's already on Show Studio. It's already on Show Studio. It's already been photographed by Britt Lloyd. Every day. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, and I've teamed that up with um, a piece from the Right, Right, Right collection from uh, 2001, which was one of his probably one of the times. I mean, I was reading this interview by Kathy Horing um, in New York Times back in 2005, actually, uh, right when he was appointed for Gilles Sander. And um, she was saying at the point that Ralph changed three times uh, the men's work mm -hmm. until that point, of course. Um, uh, one was in his early, early career when he came out like with a very kind of narrow suits, yeah. narrow tailoring, you know, narrow shoulders. The second time was with Riot and in early 2001 with all the Layering collections, and the third time was with um, the really high uh, um, uh, waisted trousers and Eisenhower jackets. So, uh, Ralph has reinvented and has changed quite a lot of fashion, and this is what we see here. But what is your award that you're going to pick up? What was the other two? Creative freedom, and what was the other one? Challenge. Challenge. You'd love challenge, I <laughs> think. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess that is a challenge because he's always he is always challenging the system right from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. right, so like I said before, he didn't see a, a fashion that he could relate to. Mm -hmm. So he, he was challenging everything like the Gucci of the prevalent thing was kind of like the Gucci kind of fashion. He was challenging that directly. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like the first challenge. And then he's you know he's kind of challenged throughout what he's done. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes mentioning this collection. Mm -hmm. So the, the, sort of he took a it took a year sabbatical, so he wasn't afraid to take a year out. Took some time out for himself, where he was teaching in a design <coughs> school in, in Antwerp, I believe, and it was also kind of working with a, a rich uh, shipping magnate in terms of like sort of consulting on his on his oh, art collection. Yeah. It's so healthy to do that, to take time out. Take time out. Yeah. I think sometimes creatives now, myself included, but especially sort of creative directors, some some are afraid to kind of step off. Yeah. Sort of, you know, the, yeah. the wheel. Yeah. They think it's what Karen said do, about isolation. Exactly. If you if you spend some time on your own, you, you're stabilizing all your thoughts because none of us stop for a minute mm. to even process what we're yeah. what we're living. Yeah. But yeah, and also I think looping back to the, to the question as well, the challenge. challenge. Talking about you mentioned the kind of like the three kind of mm -hmm. moments he's really shifted the kind of the shape and silhouette mm -hmm. of, of menswear. Um, that's him kind of challenging himself as well. He's, he doesn't want to be sort of pigeonholed into into one angle. You see directly sort of really challenging himself mm -hmm. to kind of push things forward and that's always what he's kind of striving to do. Do you think that he's challenging though? I mean, not now because obviously, you know, Ralph Simmons is a hugely recognizable brand, but do you think that when he was starting and in the first, let's say, decade or 15 years, how difficult it was to remain independent? That was a challenge probably because the structure probably wasn't the same as it is right now. Yeah. Um, the, the challenges as being a young designer are not the same. Uh, don't you think that throughout all these times, and I'm sure he had like his own difficulties as most of the young designers have, you know, at this stage, he didn't think about actually, you know, if I wasn't independent, things would be much easier for me. Because he went through like, when, when the Gilles Sander um, appointment happened, uh, he still was 10 years old as a brand, as a Ralph mm -hmm. Simmons brand. So he was still young. So he, but, and, and back then, the Gilles Sander um, brand was owned by uh, Prada Group. Mm -hmm. So he, probably he could have done a deal like that, but um, he remained independent. But yeah, but he's always, yeah, he's also used kind of opportunities to kind of to push himself forward. So mm -hmm. when he took the sabbatical, one of the reasons why his, his design studio got too big, mm -hmm. and he couldn't, he, he, he couldn't really control it. So mm -hmm. he kind of really reduced it. Mm -hmm. And also on the, on the flip side of that, got, um, Tweaked his production side, and he kind of got. I think he got some kind of like sort of sponsorship on, on that side and changed producers. <coughs> a license agreement. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So he's he's been very smart in that as well. Um, so it's, it's that kind of like a combination of quite being quite business savvy, but mm -hmm. very yeah, but not relinquishing any control. Sort of creative. Isn't control. it business savvy though? 
in a way, <coughs> doing your own thing, I think, is a complete indulgence, an indulgence right. that we all mm -hmm. deserve. Mm -hmm. yeah. And wanting to maintain his own independent yeah. um, atelier, whatever you want to call it, um, doing these business deals, that's almost like something he was smart enough to do to ensure that he could, he could continue mm -hmm. doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't, yeah. think, I don't think with him it's ever vanity. I think it's just no. he wants no. to create, no, he, he wants, wants to be create, doing yeah. it. I mean, it's always, it's, I mean, there's so many interviews throughout sort of the 90s and, and, and 2000s where he's kind of like pushing back on the title of, of, of fashion designer. He doesn't really see himself as a fashion yeah. designer. He just chooses fashion as his kind of chief medium to kind of explore these kind of creative ideas, mm -hmm. um, which I think is interesting. That's really nice. And creative freedom here? I mean, I think <laughs> he, he's got that creative freedom because, you know, there's no CEO or there's no commercial director telling him what to design, mm -hmm. which has been the downfall of many companies recently. Mm. He also probably saw how Helmut Lang mm -hmm. fell mm -hmm. because, you know, he had that investment and mm -hmm. lost his name. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really precious to him is keeping his own name, mm -hmm. definitely. Mm -hmm. um, so he's learnt those lessons and he's grown very slowly. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important thing for people today starting their own label. Mm -hmm. It's a really admirable thing not to sell out and want to be with a massive mega brand. Mm -hmm. All this, all rushing. I yeah. think that's yeah. one of the things that we all. But see. actually, it's paid off now because he's got a crazy wage at Calvin. So you know, and he, he's got like a really nice setup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what do you think that the the challenges between the the designers of Ralph Simon's status? that they design, I mean, because I think he's one of the few, I really was trying yesterday to think about like lots of other designers that do what Ruff does, which is basically, you know, to design for a big house, but also run his own independent brand. Can we think of anyone else actually? Because I was, I was trying to yeah. think about it, that they haven't, the they, they they haven't I mean, I see him as, as undercover, I see yeah. him like the undercover thing, okay. mm -hmm. but they don't have the big, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because you can find designers that they remain independent, like Dries, for example, he hasn't sold his brand, but he's not designing for someone else. But for someone to do both of these things, you know, I, I think he probably must be... And to sustain it. <laughs> it's what you call real depth of drive. Um, he's got a lot to say. Mm -hmm. So he has, he has the tools and he has the receipts mm -hmm. to show that he can deliver. Okay. Um, but I guess he delivers more than most because he kept, he kept his name. Yes. Mm. And he's allowed, like you said, he's allowed to do his own thing in his own way. That is the way forward. And that's what I was saying before about uh, people saying that they're designers and they have a crew of people. Mm -hmm. No matter what you do, it's never the same feeling mm -hmm. as when you own it and you know that your name's on it. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to deliver mm -hmm. or you give up. For sure. He said something, I think, in, um, in, a, in an interview about, they asked him about Margiela, mm -hmm. and he said um, he really admired um, that Margiela said what he had to say, mm -hmm. and he said it's a wrap. Yes. And it looks like he's, he's got a lot more to say, mm -hmm. and um, hopefully we'll, we'll see a lot more come out of his own label. Mm -hmm. Because like you say, when you're working for someone else, you got to follow a brief mm -hmm, yeah. and you know that's frustrating that can break you down that can destroy but with you. calvin i feel like he's sh he's proved that he doesn't need to stick to a brief i think yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree i, I, I agree yeah. i think the, I agree. CEO, the current agree, yeah. ceo of calvin is really modern thinking he's thought how can i solve this problem and he's kept it as, as we're, we're making money but we're not quite where we should be mm -hmm. and we could probably double our profits and become a, you know, they, they were a billion dollar company already. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how brave of that CEO to think, I'm going to give him as much creative freedom and it, it worked. Do you well, think it's brave or is, think do you think it's like label. super smart to do? Because he was yeah. the only one that he could. I think it's brave because, because for me, CEOs mm. can fuck up companies. Yeah. <laughs> and back, <laughs> I, you know, we saw house. backers so fuck up Vivian Westwood in the <laughs> 90s. There is another side of that coin though, um, mm. if, if, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard because if you give a designer creative freedom, yeah. you know, without the res mutual respect, you know, it, it can be terrible. I mean, they, yeah. they could mm. just, you know, wipe the floor and just... Mm. Yeah, he could have come in, taken millions of dollars and, and just ruined it, yeah. it and run it into the ground. But, but, he, it, but it's trust. It. And I imagine that before mm. that relationship, you know, it wasn't like, oh, do you want this job? 
three months later sign. I reckon that that, that was lots of meetings. Oh, yeah, sure. No, I think they were you know, talking. A bit like the old school Italians, sure. where they spend yeah. a holiday together to get to know each other, mm. or, or the Chinese culture, mm -hmm. yeah. where mm -hmm. they kind of watch each other. You know, once once they've met, so that they they see how they behave and yeah. how mm -hmm. it's going to work. But I think people forget that when you go to you know when you have your own um, fashion label, it's very rudimentary. You kind of playing on favors. Mm -hmm. People come and help. You have to pick fabrics that you maybe don't want to use yeah. because you can't afford the more expensive one. But when you go to these big jobs, you forget mm -hmm. the gear shift is mm -hmm. shocking. Yeah. I mean, straight away you want buttons. You've got like probably somebody in charge of the buttons that comes and shows you this incredible yeah, yeah. archive. Well, what do you want? And it's yeah. like, oh my god. And actually, someone like Raf, he probably doesn't want to be spoiled like that. No, no, no. But. To, to create the um, Calvin Klein, it's, it, there's people in place to kind of help yeah. him be the best version for of sure. Calvin Klein yeah, for sure. he, he wants to be. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's great. I mean, I was thinking also, because with Ralph, he has a huge passion about art, basically. And every, almost every interview that I've uh, read um, by Ralph, he keeps mentioning all this. Uh, artists that he's working very, very closely with. He's really admiring them and he really respects them. Um, and I would like a bit like to discuss about between fashion and art, those two type of worlds. Because let's let's see a bit about Ralph Simmons. He, he loves C.D. Sherman, George Conto. He's worked with Sterling Ruby in a number of occasions. You know, he, they, they launched an ex extremely successful collection. Um, he has worked on uh, Dior. He has worked on Calvin Klein. He's done. He redesigned the the store in New York. Um, then we have the Robert Mapplethorpe Foundation. Uh, we have Andy Warhol Foundation, uh, and for his brand and also for the the other brands that he worked and Calvin Klein, uh, Brian Calvin as well that he did back in spring summer thirteen. Um, he loves ceramics because he has uh, referenced Paul Chambost, you know, like in collections with Richard Sander, uh, Joe Juve. So he's, he has a wide um, respect about, a huge respect for artists. And there's a big debate between fashion and art. Is fashion art or um, can borrow elements from art and how these two worlds I think you mentioned this, this is the big system interview mm -hmm. that I'm sure we've all read, which mm -hmm. was just incredible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How precious to be a fly on the wall with a conversation between Raf and Mitra Prada. Yes, it um, was amazing. And uh, I think in that interview, um, Mitra Prada said that, you know, she, she doesn't mind that her company's so big because mm -hmm. fashion is her way of getting her creativity out there. It's, mm -hmm. it's almost her portal. Mm -hmm. And if that didn't work, she would be an art. She would become an artist. For sure. You know, I think she created the Fondazione, though. So she she has created the the foundation basically where she has all the artists that probably she respects and works with. Um, so yeah, so it's it's a very very. It's important. interesting. I was talking yeah. to a fashion designer yesterday who is is in the system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, they're sh they're making a collection. They're going to Paris and all this, and and they're feeling a bit you know deflated with the whole thing. And and I was saying you know you need to create your own narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're so creative, if you wanted to have an art show and become an artist and turn this fashion into sculpture, mm -hmm. you've got every right to do that. Mm -hmm. If that if that's going to help you mm -hmm. breathe creatively. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think we're all creating our own narrative, mm -hmm. and I think that, you know, the that collection that you talked about, the Sterling Ruby, mm -hmm. I mean, that was incredible because he Amazing. actually called it Ralph Simmons and Sterling Ruby. Mm -hmm. He rebranded yeah. it. I mean, all those uh, stores where he sells, their systems couldn't even cope with it. Yeah. Because suddenly they had to call it a different label, and they wanted to <laughs> you're, you're so right because that <laughs> happened to us as well. So that happened to us, um, and it happened in in a number of occasions. And this is something that we actually need to, it's, it's so nice that you're mentioning that, because also when he did the Robert Mabethorpe um, Foundation, he did exactly the same thing on the tag. Every, and but this he's is, a generous he's a generous like person, that. you know, he, he, he gives almost like a black canvas, of course, it's, it's a very intellectual design, goes always into his collections, oh. but he gives a space and to in every that interview, artist. In that yeah. interview, he did say, um, I think, um, he'll go and design Prada? Uh, Prada. Would yeah, you yeah. go and design Prada or Marc Jacobs? They were Mark saying Jacobs that, yeah. Marc Jacobs will go and design Prada and yeah. Mutual will go and design Raph. <laughs> and, and, and they actually thought, and, and Mutual was so excited by that in the <laughs> interview, and it's like, 
that they're stuck in the system where they, where they can't quite do that. Mm -hmm. But actually, there's no rules anymore, so you can actually do that. And I can, I can, they really thought that that was the way forward to mm -hmm. do. Not crazy. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Really, but look how excited I yeah. Mean, yeah. 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 yeah, that yeah. was yeah. exciting. It writes its own press release, doesn't yeah. it? It's We're, like, and it's hard to shift clothes sometimes. Yeah. What it's everyone thinks about this relationship between fashion and art? I mean, um, I think it's important that today the, the new and upcoming uh, designers and the people that are going to schools right now, I think he's a, a fantastic mentor to mm -hmm. look towards because he doesn't do things blindly. Mm -hmm and it's not all over the place. It always has a very direct point of view. Mm -hmm. And with art, art will always help you have a more deeper mm -hmm. and more valid point of view mm -hmm. to express because art, of course, is a reflection of popular culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I think with Raph, he always embraces popular culture when it's happening right then and there. Um, when I'm looking at the last couple of collections and even the new one, you know, there's so many things that that can excite me about that and it can remind me of, of how important he's taking on board what's happening on the streets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yes, there is a revival of this whole generation that he reflects here, the whole Warhol, Glenn O'Brien, TV party, you know, <laughs> revelation, mm -hmm. which of course I was a part of somewhat. <laughs> what we all want to Ish. hear about. <laughs> about you, we, we all want to hear about that. That's, that's no, good. That's like, before was really you know, interesting about what you thought Warhol would say if he came. Yeah, in. I mean, I think, I think, um, I think, Raph. We're fortunate enough to know. Because. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, like I said before, it's all well and good to look online, which is unfortunately where our generation is right now. They look online on Instagram, and this whole thing of research. There's nothing that's one plus one anymore because you can't touch it can't touch Warhol. Mm -hmm. You can read all day long, but if you didn't sit down and speak to him, you'll never get that feeling, yeah. no matter what. I feel blessed to be my age, to have been able to, to um, experience that whole essence of what he was about. And he was basically about being spontaneous. Yeah. And he was one of the first satorialists, mm -hmm. besides Bill, uh, which we live for. But um, he, was out, he was one of the first satorialists. And I think that that's one thing that he pushed forward, um, the time that he would go out, where he would go, he would be on the street, he'd be at a party, whatever. He wouldn't seek out people who, who everyone thought was the right person to be with. Mm -hmm. He would seek out people that no one's looking at. He would see their light and he would go there and he would let them know how big their light was. Mm -hmm. And I think that Raph it engages that within his shows and within his collections. And now I've noticed too, the last couple of years, how diverse his casting has become. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. He has totally reflected the Americana. Mm -hmm. yeah. 200, like. You hinted about that in an old interview, actually. I think we, I think Terry interviewed him in, in, um, in the late 90s and mm -hmm. we, they, we brought up the diversity issue because it is something that plagued him in his early, early years. Mm -hmm. um, and he, his basis, his response was, well, I grew up in Antwerp and, and there was no diversity. He said, mm. if I'd have designed in New York, then my diversity, you know, it might be, it might be, it might be really diverse casting. Mm. We're actually seeing that now that he's mm -hmm. in New York and he's based in New York. Mm. The casting now, now, now mirrors that, so he's kind of mm. true to his word. I thought that was quite interesting going back. I think he has a lot of respect mm. for things. Mm -hmm. Respect is something that really needs to be pushed right now mm -hmm. because there's no respect anymore. Yeah. Everything's become a circus. I left New York when Warhol died. Why? Because there was no one else there mm -hmm. to say, this is crap yeah. and this is together. <laughs> There's no one left. Yeah. It, was all, it was all left up to kids from Scarsdale, <laughs> as if. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I mean, I did the doors at that time. And the way I did doors was to, to reflect what should happen inside. Mm -hmm. I was hard as nails um, because I wanted to keep inside precious and sacred and fantastic and exciting. <laughs> and I didn't want anyone to, to ruin it because their mind wasn't opened enough. And I think with Raph, I think he opens your mind and still keeps it authentic yeah. and makes you think about stuff. I'm looking at the, the Dickie update that he's just done with the sweater. <laughs> and of course, we all know that that's a feeling right now mm -hmm. from Margiela to Vetmont mm -hmm. to Balenciaga. 
He still kept it tight, boo. Still. <laughs> Even though it's in still the still end, kept I think it he's tight, very kept brave. It attractive. Like, I'm yeah. going to do my version of it. Do you know yeah, what I mean? He's not he's afraid. He's not afraid of someone saying, yeah. oh, well, I th doesn't that look like last season's this? Now? He doesn't give a no. shit. No. It looks like him. Yeah. 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 And I think that he manages to hold the strength of his name. It's all due to respect for art mm -hmm. and respect for the space that people have when they're working with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the key point is like sort of appropriation versus celebration. I think Karen, you kind of mentioned that there's a prevalence of of, of, of our generation, or the next generation, kind of researching just purely online, not really living it. He really knows his. You know, he could talk for hours. I'm sure about some most of the artists that he that he oh, works sure. with. Um, you get that he kind of really does put his kind of these passions mm -hmm. and his loves on the actual sleeves of his mm -hmm. garments, heart mm -hmm. and sleeve of, of the garments. Um, yeah, for me, that's the big. That's the big difference. He's, he's, a, he's a celebrator and he's a curator, and he's not afraid to, yeah, share his name. <coughs> he's a curator. I mean, he's, he's done also quite a few exhibitions and um, throughout, like all his career, even on an early stage. Actually, you know, mm -hmm. he he took like the curation projects on him. But um, do you think that maybe it's a bit far-fetched? But do you think that the impact that Andy Warhol had um, one day, Ralph Simmons is going to have? I think he already has it. Yeah. I think um, he's doing his best to make it his. Mm -hmm. um, he's not taking Warhol and putting the blonde wig on and saying, that's me, <laughs> um, which unfortunately a lot of people are doing right now in the industry. Mm -hmm. They're taking something and putting their name on it as if it belongs to them. Mm -hmm. This is a disgrace. And this is something that Warhol would spit at. Um, with Raph, I think he's, he's taken on board the idea behind why Warhol existed. Mm -hmm. And it's to nurture authenticity, 100%. Um, hopefully, if he's going to continue working with the Warhol Foundation, mm -hmm. I hope he uh, travels out of the small world of the fashion teams mm -hmm. and ventures out into people that actually knew Warhol, understood what his, his thesis was, understood his movement, because only then can he learn how to redevelop that within his own brand and his own name. But it's, you know, it's, it's such a crowded uh, space right now in fashion. Like I said, people are always pushed to work with just certain types of people. You have to step out of that realm. Which is why I think that we're drawn to people that have got this um, soulful heart. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the sort of designers that we go for. I mean, when he's been interviewed, he talks about how he doesn't understand why people, they all buy beautiful clothes, but they don't go beyond the surface of what the clothes look like. Mm -hmm. they don't, they don't, they're not bothered about the narrative or the reasoning or the inspiration, and he can't relate to that whatsoever. <laughs> he shouldn't have to. You know, there's enough room, like I said, for everybody to do what they have to do. Um, Warhol represented radicalism. Mm -hmm. And no, this is not my answer for this question. Mm -hmm. You can accept it or not, it doesn't matter. It's gonna stay here and it's gonna exist. And it might take a little time for you to understand it, but it's better to take that chance that they might not understand it right away. Because mm -hmm. we all learn from things that we don't completely understand at first. For sure, for sure. Um, that's really great. So I think that we should go and talk a bit about the, um, the, the collection. collection. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Youth in Motion. Uh, Can you save me one of the t-shirts, please, huh? when the order comes in? Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> actually, we're going to talk a bit about the collection. Then I'm going to have like an aside order <laughs> for like all the people here. You know, like, so I'm, like putting oh, already a few locks now. <laughs> I started yeah. the numbers <laughs> because everyone is asking about this one. So uh, as we said in the beginning, basically. Uh, We've already driven you mad before this interview for the la rap lantern. Yes, <laughs> yes. Oh. They asked me about yeah, the Someone just texted well. you an order as well. I just yes. read <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically, uh, looking at this collection, obviously, as we said in the beginning, he, uh, we see two main features. One is Christiana F. Um, is uh, obviously for uh, whoever doesn't know, uh, it's a book. Um, it's a very, fa very famous book back in 1981. And of course, it became also a movie. Uh, one of the most probably iconic ones, personally, I have read the book like about 15 times when I was like a teenager. And I think it affected a lot of teenagers back in 80s and 90s. And it has been referenced hugely as a movie um, in many big campaigns and advertising campaigns and everything. So that's the one 
main feature. So that's why in the, uh, the, the title in German was Wir Kinder auf der Bahnhofsu, and we see it uh, on the collection. We see here the two actors actually that they played, and we're talking earlier, Steve, about that because um, one of the main actors, um, Thomas Halstein, who played Detlef, uh, he gave a really amazing interview in Vice, mm -hmm. and he was talking a bit about the whole experience. But you were saying to me that Christiane, who is a real story, and Christiane is still alive. Still yeah. alive, yeah. And she, and she um, gave an interview, so she, right? So, she, so the, the book itself was, was based on her life between the ages of 12 and 15, where mm -hmm. she kind of fell into. Um, in West Berlin, when she fell into to heroin and, and prostitution, so it was mm -hmm. a super super young age. And uh, and Raf, when he was talking about when he first referenced Christiana F in 2001 with the Right 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 collection, he said that he saw the film um, in when he was 14. He said he was too young to see it, and it really kind of impacted him. And we think we can all relate to to that when we're mm -hmm. in our adolescence, coming of age, and we, we watch something that kind of changes our our world. With, you know, when we're probably too young for it, but it kind of propels us. And I think that's what happened for him personally with this film um, but yeah she talks uh, she gave an interview with Vice uh, in 2013 mm -hmm. she talked about her relationship with the film mm -hmm. um, and she wasn't that she wasn't actually personally a huge fan of it she mm -hmm. thought it kind of glamorized drug use a little bit mm -hmm. because the film itself even though it's very very dark it has David Bowie who did the yes. soundtrack and it's like heroes played throughout the trailer also. it's like yeah. you know, so it is there is that element, the same element which with train spotting where it's not actually glamorizing drugs really but it can be construed as that by certain mm -hmm. sectors mm -hmm. and I think as adolescents we're always kind of drawn to the kind of things that we shouldn't do anyway yes yeah. so there is that kind of element to it um, and she wrote a second memoir so that so the film itself was based on her first memoir when she was basically speaking to, to, to journalists when she was like 16. Mm -hmm. um, and then she wrote one, it's called My Second Life. So it's kind of like what happened mm -hmm. after that. And she had, you know, she moved to New York for a little while and she got um, mm -hmm. kicked out of New York because she was found with, with various opiates on a purse and she wasn't allowed back in. So she's actually, when the interview in 2013, she was actually living back in, okay. back in Germany. Okay. And she was saying that, you know, she hopefully that she wanted her second memoir to kind of be, to be even darker and kind of put people mm -hmm. to, to, to steal the message that, that drugs are, mm -hmm. are, uh, are aren't to be messed with, and that's something that Raf was in the, in the in the show notes is, is very very keen to kind of to to uh, to make sure of that people are aware of that he's not glamorizing drugs. No. It is, it is. That's, 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 that's a hundred percent sure. Yeah. You know. Before, before, very before very the parents write, that's that's, that's a hundred percent sure. I mean, yeah. whoever doesn't know the Christiana F book, basically the story is that it's actually a real story of Christiana mm -hmm. F, who is like the um, she, a German girl that. Um, she hangs out and she meets Detlef, who is like the two main protagonists, pretty much. And then they have like a real group of people that is when heroin is for the first time appears and uh, everyone starts taking it. And then, you know, you see like this whole journey of, you know, going through like detox and try like to get out of it. And it's, um, it's yeah, it's quite iconic and all. Uh, and of course, you know, it has, um, because they, they need money for drugs as, normally happens and then they, ha they start in prostitution and is in this specific place that is called Bahnhof Zoo, it's like a train station in Berlin. So um, that, that, that was the film and that was the book about and it's I think what to me was when I was a teenager and I was reading that book, um, why I was so drawn into it was because they were real characters, they were real people and in the book there are like all the, the images of them, you know that you can see them, you can differently relate to the whole situation. I mean, it's not like Alice in Wonderland that, you know, it's, it's you, you're thinking about something like completely like different. Um, so that's, that's the, the, the one main reference. The second one is um, a book that is called Drugs by Quickie Muller and Glenn O'Brien. Now this, um, it's, it's actually a playwright that was written back in 1984 and 1995 um, and uh, the book was published very recently uh, in 2016 by Kingsborough Press. Uh, the, the book itself is, is a story between basically two main, again, characters and the group of friends that they go throughout different phases trying off different type of drugs and then how the story ends with pretty much one of them um, sort of dies. So, I'm saying sort of dies because it's not very clear in the book, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, I think, but I think he dies. This is, this is, this is what, what the meaning is. Yeah. Um, so, 
you kind of like touch the subject is why Ralph you think that all of a sudden chooses to touch that subject, you know, the, the subject of drugs, because drugs is uh, the main characteristic, both in Christian F and in the book, uh, of drugs. So why he's now commenting on it? I think it's still a massive problem. It's yeah. a massive yeah. problem in America. He's in America. He's mm -hmm. probably seen a lot more of America now, mm -hmm. a lot more American TV, a lot mm -hmm. more news than what he did before when he was in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I think this is reflecting what's going on in America, mm -hmm. definitely. Okay. And how the massive yeah, problem is with, now, yeah, with crystal meth. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just heroin, it's ridiculous. Well, so much of it stems from prescribed drugs, drugs as well. And that's what he mentioned mm -hmm. in, yeah. in, in, the, in, in, the, in the press release as well, mm -hmm. because. They start on they start on prescribed drugs. They run out and they then they go down and, and they go to heroin. They go to and crystal meth. They go to up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you hear about it in the media yeah. regularly now. People that were on heavy painkillers and then they get addicted to them. Yeah. And, yeah. What happened? and I think I think he uh, I could be completely wrong. Yes. I think he um, does this type of thing like uh, okay for instance. You could say drugs in so many different ways. Why does he choose the Glenn O'Brien play? Mm. Yes. I think it's because he's um, urging youth culture to start reading again. Mm -hmm. I think, and start re-educating themselves on other subcultures mm -hmm. and the end result. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, for instance, this uh, play that Glenn O'Brien was a part of, and if you ever watch Glenn O'Brien on, online, which is what you can only do right now, um, his subculture ideas were incredible because he, he took them from first-hand points of view. And with RAF, I think this whole reason behind, and I'm looking at the collection right now, the stamp of drugs, it's not just to say drugs, like read why I put this here. Mm -hmm. This is an educational point of view now. Mm -hmm. Where does it come from? Oh, it comes from the Glenn O'Brien Bray, which means you have to go online, and read or you it. have to go into a shop, you have to actually read a book about it. Yeah. Because it's so but if you can find it, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> if you can find it, spend a lot of money on, on it. But yeah. Everybody wants actually, to be down, so the they'll book. find it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a little common, basically, because the book itself was, and this is why it became sold out instantly, it, it, it was a limited copy of 500, and uh, it was costing $20, because the price was uh, that this is how much it costs if you go out in the street and buy a dose for drugs. Mm -hmm. So you yes. shouldn't, so people shouldn't pay more money, actually, to get that book. That was the whole concept behind it. And I think um, there is a discussion uh, that probably something is going to happen again with that book and uh, profits and earnings, as you said, is going to go like to well, um, profits from, this from this collection. Yeah. Go to a lot of yeah, 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 yeah. Amazing. To a lot of charities. So um, uh, I, I completely agree with your point. Actually, that he's yeah. sending a message of like message educational to... message. Actually, you know, go and read about it before you start, you know, getting involved with it or we start doing it. You know, I don't think he ever says do it or don't do it. Yeah, it just yeah. says, you know, go and search for it. It's suggestive. suggestive. Yeah. You know, it's like, get your shit together. Don't think Instagram is yeah, you know. how it feels. Mm. <laughs> yeah. These are all quite cold things. Like that movie was very cold. Mm -hmm. You know, the book had a cold. Mm -hmm. You know, the people around it were very cold. So this is like tapping into that culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you see, you know, these references in the show, like LSD mm -hmm. on a kneecap patch mm -hmm. on the trousers or even just the word drug, banded around, you know, you do want to know more. You're not just going to think, oh, the word drug. Mm. <clears throat> In this show, you want to you want to dig deeper into that narrative. For sure. I also think America needs it. Mm -hmm. I think um, the American public and the youth culture right now are lost. Mm -hmm. And I think they've gotten so involved in what they see on Instagram, mm -hmm. opposed to going out and getting involved in something that actually matters. And I'm so happy that someone like him has taken on the most American company um, Calvin Klein, you don't get more American than that. Mm -hmm. And what he is saying is, yes, I'm here, but I'm going to push you cats to do what you used to do. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take you back to the, the days of Glenn O'Brien where they actually did things because they had a desire to do it mm -hmm. and they had something to say. And I feel that Americans forget that they have a lot more to say now. Mm -hmm. Take the iPad and put it under the table, mm -hmm. bro. Start going out. <laughs> Start doing what you have to do. Karen, in that, in that period when you were living mm. in New York, there was a lot of pain and suffering. A lot, and a lot of people lived down to, uh, Lower East Side, which was like, 
slightly, you know, which was really bad back then. I mean, I, you know, we've I mean, seen it was, I mean, it was yeah. attractive. I'm going to be realist. It was sexy. It was hot. It was attractive. Yeah, but the the the, uh, the undertones yeah. when I've read books about that era, yeah. you know, um, and I, and I think you know these are cultural um, themes mm -hmm. that you know it's just great that he's tapping into that. Oh, he's bringing it back because there's a reason to bring it back. Why? Because there's a lot going on right now that the youth culture can actually grab a hold of mm -hmm. and do something with. Mm -hmm. And I think he's projecting that push to them. He's not, like you say, mm -hmm. doesn't tell them what you do or not. No. Just brings it in, the, in your head space in the, and say, in, in the table. what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. And I think the intelligence of that is genius. And I hope that more designers are looking at what he's trying to portray sure. through being a designer of a new house. Mm -hmm. Just because you go in, into a new house doesn't mean only numbers. Mm -hmm. It means at the end of the day, what is the real heavy duty statement? Mm -hmm. when you buy into a brand, why do you buy into it? The message. Because of the message and because of you want that association of being fabulous the connection, too. The belonging. But just going, right? going, going back to New York back then. Okay, you want to yes. go back then? <laughs> <laughs> you want to I didn't want to explain yeah. myself very well. I, I, yeah. I just mean that, you know, we all see the glamorous stuff and all the cult stuff and there's all these great references, but even when I read Yaya Kasama's biography, you know, she talked about the scene. There's such a fine line between being part of this glamorousness and actually going under and falling victim mm -hmm. to it and the well, destructive side yeah, of it. That's always what it's like you always go been straight, to that sort of dark, you yes, go dark, right dark, to the edge of it. Yeah. And, and I think that's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I was, um, and that's probably why I'm sitting here, because I was a, a really close friend and muse of Basquiat, mm -hmm. of Jean, um, I learned the depth of how one minute everything that you're doing can be amazing but because of drugs you can actually die while you're doing it mm -hmm. and uh jean was incredible to to use as as a as a thesis on this why because he bought his first place just across the street from the homeless shelter mm -hmm. because he never wanted to forget where he came from mm -hmm. not that he came from the homeless shelter but he spent a lot of time there yes, why because that was a time of drug addiction mm -hmm. yeah. heavy um, there was there was a time where it was him, it was John Laurie, and I don't know if Glenn O'Brien was on that type mm -hmm. of tip, but you know it was all about weed for him, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Um, but they all superly indulged in drugs in Ramel order to Z. create Ramel Z, mm -hmm. who is the king, um, <laughs> and we I bow down, and uh, I was lucky enough to be around them, and the reason. It was so weird. The reason why I was drawn to them is because I had a brother who was a drug addict. Mm -hmm. I'm from Brooklyn, in the worst area you could possibly imagine. And because of that, I used to dream about getting out of it. Mm -hmm. How do you get out of it? You, you, you get out of it in a creative medium. Mm -hmm. And it's so weird how I was attracted to these people. They were all totally off their face. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking joint, we're talking heroin. It was, it was a train spotter all day, every day. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But at least from that, they were able to be to create something because yeah, yeah. they, with, within the, the fact that they were totally stoned off their face, mm -hmm. the dream was always still there. And I used to pray that, you know, one day someone's going to say, the drug stuff has just got to stop because you're going to die. I remember saying to Jean, I don't want to read about you one day. Mm -hmm. uh, artists found dead in studio. Mm -hmm. and it so that was the reality of what was going on. Because he always thought he would end up back in the homeless shelter. Mm -hmm. He thought he was two steps from it. Mm -hmm. And that was the reality of the 80s. It was like a, a kind of reminder to him the whole Constant, time to just yeah. keep that in mind. You know, mm -hmm. Right across the street. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So um, shall we go the, back um, to the yeah. laser show? Me too. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> okay, let's let's talk a bit about like the set, yeah. the music, yeah. and also you know the whole vibe of it. So yeah. first of all, I have to say that I love when Ralph goes back to do shows that everyone is standing and it's almost like a club, because he's done it quite a few times. And then I saw at the previous shows that he had a city show when yeah. he, he went like in New York. And I'm really happy that he's back in that type of format. We all know, you know how, ridiculous, like how ridiculous it is at a fashion show where people are, you know, we get, you get like <laughs> editor in chief complaining because they're sitting in the wrong seat or something. It's <laughs> yeah. such a circus. But, I mean, but obviously with their mm. rap, just democratizes <coughs> the whole process. But Every, everyone's on, the, on a yeah. level, everyone is there to good. appreciate. And that's what, it, that's what it's all about. Frank Sanz had a, a standing show two seasons ago. Yeah. It was great. You really 
mm. you it was you you just have this intimacy and also you're almost like the models there yeah. for you yeah. and yeah. Yeah. I mean, you should either be all like one 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 row or or standing or yes. everyone standing I mean I think that you know when he started doing that format I think it was really really amazing because he normally picks up like these warehouses big spaces put laser shows in there uh, makes it almost like as a rave techno party basically and then you know the models are walking uh, on these platforms and you can see them from every in single angle but also you feel more intimate in there you know you feel that you're part of the space you're part of the set you're mm -hmm. part of you know the whole um, uh, yes, yes, and not so much about just sitting and viewing from a distance yeah. the whole thing. So not only that, yeah. for, this, for this set as, as well, um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of, kind of following it online last night where people yeah. were <laughs> and well, What I mean, time do you go to bed? <laughs> the set's difficult. <laughs> you can't sleep when Raph's there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't sleep on Raph. Mm. The, the set itself is like a, like a Flemish kind of painting. Yes, of, it is. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Going back to his, yeah, yeah. his Antwerpian roots. Yes. But, um, People were like wondering whether they could they could they could eat the, the ticket. Set. And they oh, they're they, 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 being they were, encouraged to do yeah, that. Like yeah. The art consultant were going around and, and, and encouraging yeah. people. Yes. There was like red wine there. There were there were like charcuterie boards. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Molly Goddard it's, did that as well. She was she had like food and stuff yeah. at one mm -hmm. of her shows with a big banquet. The interaction because there's always that thing where you're kind of watching a show but you not you don't really feel part of it. Mm -hmm. but, but Raf really you know he, he, not only are they are they within touch and distance of, mm -hmm. of, 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 of the garments, they, they can be part of the set and they can, you know, part of the whole narrative. Uh, and another thing to mention on the actual set itself, that, I mean, there was a, a crazy amount of food or th throughout, but rather than waste it, it was donated yeah. to um, City Harvest, which is like kind of a, a New York oh, yes. um, charity which gives food to, for, to, home, that's, to the homeless. That's, that's I mean, to me, this is what Warhol would have done. <laughs> yeah. This looks like a, a party in the factory. Mm -hmm. He would have said, right, whoever gets here first, they're getting a seat, yeah. or they're getting in the front. Too bad if you're too late. <laughs> and I think that that point of view is everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that he went through the trouble of the set, but like yeah. you said, the interactiveness of it, yeah. the rawness of it, mm -hmm. it really feels like you're in 1981. Yeah. Mm. If that makes any sense. Okay. It feels like an, a complete art installation as yeah. well. You know, yeah, you, know, you really do. You know, you and I feel like design. that that's where he'll go. I don't think he'll be Raph Simmons, the man's way designer forever. I think he'll be an artist towards Hopefully the end. Hopefully he can do both. Yeah. Yeah. He, he can I do think both. he's going to do a helmet and just kind of disappear from fashion. Because both? No, no, no. Like you know, he might create like a foundation, you know, and someday that is going to be all You know what's really, really, really interesting about this too is there's um, a club from the 80s and the 90s called Area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, curated by Serge Becker and um, a few others. Mm -hmm. I say Serge Becker because I think he was the genius and he's still holding it down in New York. Mm -hmm. Anything that happens that's great there, he does it. And every two months they would change the decor of the club. So it would become interactive just like this. Yeah, they, they, had a, they had like real meat carcasses hanging yeah. out in the club one time. And oh, it was amazing. I used yeah. to do um, Saturday nights once in a while there and I would bring a whole nother set of people in. But it reminds me of that scene of where, you know, your, your show is your art forum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think it's great. Uh, Diane Pernay always said to me, she said, Mandy, if you were in New York then, you wouldn't have been at Studio Food. We'd have been at Area. Yeah, you'd have been. <laughs> <laughs> because you had walls and rooms of people eating and serving each other yeah. and having sex and God knows what else. <laughs> but I just think that he's really, at least he's taken uh, a feeling of that time, mm -hmm. it still makes it his own. Mm -hmm. That's so difficult. There's, there's, yeah. there's a kind of little subliminal message as well with all the flowers as well, because mm. at the end of Dior, you know, it was very moving because mm. it was his last show, yeah, and it was very it was emotional, amazing. and they had all this, this like flower installation, so this kind of has a little bit of mm. join the dots going mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Too. But also looking at the, the outfits, and I mean, we, we've seen the collection, and what is pretty amazing uh, with these ones is that he also goes back to something that is very, very important to him, which is fabrics. Uh, Raf is, is is very, very focused on you know textures and fabrics, and uh, he's very, very specific into it. And I don't know how much we can see from the images here, but um, all these are silk and satins, actually. You know the the trousers and the inside of the garments. You know, actually, you know when you open them, they have like lots of uh, multi pocket, lots of pockets. You know, from inside and padded it's ones. padded ones. Yeah. And it's all about the inner as well as you know the out. So that that Which type, actually, yeah. Jake Sando 
was always about. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, in the little um, Italian So you can brown, sit here on the black coat, the, yeah. The alteration ladies always said that, yeah. you know, if you said, oh, which designer is the best designer? So Jill Sander, you can wear it inside yeah. out. You wouldn't even be able to tell. It's so beautiful. Yeah. So he's, he's doing all these, like, beautiful fabrics also, the, the collection, and also the shapes and the trousers, the silk ones. It's a beautiful, beautiful collection. Do you have fabric outfits? from what you see around right now. Which are your favorite Looking picks? at the purple and black, jumper over the white. I want to hear. <laughs> well, Seek out. Is that the one who's less Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Like yes. a print, obviously. And I just think it's so, like so you like the, 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 the pants with the knee pads, right? Yeah, aesthetically. Yeah. Like yeah. The what about you, Karen? I'm the dicky jumper. It's everything. <laughs> The color, the usage of the knitwear. Knitwear is so difficult to do beautifully. Mm -hmm. And I think his knitwear is exquisite. I think it's elegant and it's hardcore and it, just the color excites you. Mm -hmm. uh, what about you, Steve? My personal favorite is actually the kind of like the, the tailoring at the beginning, Me too. quite early on. Um, because it's something we haven't really seen him mm -hmm. kind of touch upon really. I agree. Um, and that kind of is an echo to his his early, early years, I think, so in the 90s. There's an element of Jill, what he was doing at Jill Sander as well, but with, you know, potentially, but... Um. There's a beautiful like type of uh, very narrow uh, shoulder suit that is going to be a completely new way of doing things. Mm. And I think um, uh, it's, it's in this collection, it looks absolutely beautiful. I think it's going to change again the shape of how mm. guys are get dressed. And I also love the... the so the patches, but the, the Christian F ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the patches are two everything. characters on, on, on both legs. I think, they're, I think that's great. I think the outerwear is genius because it's yeah. that mix between it's like a formal mm -hmm. piece of outerwear, but mm -hmm. then it, it actually, you know, it looks like a lot of his earlier outerwear, mm -hmm. which of course is a bit of the thing that I've collected over the years. And the, gl the gloves, I can really use a pair. Of yeah, no, he's got the, uh, the little virgin gloves fetish a killer. Yeah, tie love with it. the undercover hat that they're picking. I like that it's fetish, but also it could be, it's like a higher couture sleeve, so it's almost mm. like couture as well. It's like 50s well, couture. it looks like his gender update is fantastic, oh, for sure. too. Gender update, I love it. I love that. <laughs> That's a tea. That Virgil's going to be nicking that. that. <laughs> That's an update, isn't it? It's huge. No, his gender update is Fantasia. It's Why? A, because... <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm a boy but I'm a boy but I'm a boy with a girl and a boy like it's a total so boy amazing. girl sensuality <laughs> that is just it's attractive mm. but it is an update hmm. <laughs> because well, people think gender is meaning a guy has to wear makeup to have a female side that's got nothing to do with anything you know? absolutely right mm. So I think we're coming to an end, and oh. probably my final question is going to be a critical one. Do we think that Ralph Simmons is above any hard criticism? Is he, when he's, he has become that designer, that can we criticize, or it's very, very difficult to do? Because obviously we had like this lovely conversation today, but do we feel that can we criticize anything in that sense? Um, I would probably say whoever would criticize what Raf does is someone that is not opening their mind enough to art and its involvement in fashion. And I don't think he cares anyway if there is any no. criticism. I, I think, think everybody will receive I think he's at that place where Hamlet Lang was before mm. money got involved, mm -hmm. mm. backers, interference mm. and being bought out. Mm -hmm. I think that that creative freedom is really important. I think the minute that switches, mm -hmm. you lose it. Mm -hmm. mm. And I think at the moment, no one can touch him. Mm -hmm. and everyone copies him. Everyone. To a level. Yeah, this might not last forever, <laughs> but at the moment, I think he is. Yeah. 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 I mean, we, I think and maybe that creative freedom is the one thing that keeps him from going down that, the wrong oh, route. Yeah, yeah there it's you go. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think no one is safe in this business. So if they're not, do, if what they're producing is not amazing, they, they they're, they're not they're not free from criticism. I mean, someone like Mitra Prada, who's who is you know a goddess, still gets criticised from time to time now because people are questioning, oh, is she is she relevant? Raf is this time and in the recent few, in recent um, recent times has been ridiculously relevant. Mm. Um, you know. Well, on on that note, <laughs> we should say first of all, congratulations on Raf Simmons for yeah. delivering yeah. one more. Fantastic collection.